Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're looking at the Sig Spear Light, which is basically a, the most a modern version of the MCX carbine. This comes uh, very much along with the M7 uh, new rifle, the new uh, rifle for the U.S. military. Uh, at least uh, what the Army says at this point, the uh, six by fifty-one millimeter rifle. Now the six, now that particular rifle was developed more recently uh, compared to the MCX. Uh, the MCX is what we see here, which was around 2012 when this made its appearance. So we're just going to give you a little bit of a brief history of the original MCX, uh, and then we're going to get into the spear. Now the MCX, uh, Sig was approached by a foreign customer, a special operations customer, who wanted a rifle that was, that was chambered in 300 blackout, and they wanted one that was going to work suppressed and unsuppressed with both supersonic and subsonic ammunition. So Sig engineers wanted to work on that. So we did a recently did an interview uh, around uh, around June of uh, last year uh, where we interviewed Chris Rice, who was the senior engineer uh, who worked on this project. And he was saying during the development of this, they were working on, initially there was a 300 blackout, and then they also turned it into a 5.56. It was not designed as a 5.56, it was designed as a 300 blackout, and then it was chambered in uh, in 5.56, and then on top of that, it's 7.62 by 39. So basically they wanted the new system, they wanted to mirror all the M16 uh, type controls because again, the M16 has the finest human engineering of any rifle in the world for as far as the way you manipulate it, your hand is on the pistol grip and everything is within within sweep of your hands. You don't have to adjust your, your grip for anything. Now there are some modifications that were made uh, over, the, over the standard M42 for as far as a better magazine release. It was a much, much larger, a better uh, bolt catch. Uh, which is easier to reach as well, as well as an ambidextrous safety, ambidextrous charging handle. Now it utilizes the standard uh, M16 fire control group minus the automatic sear. Automatic sear is a little bit different, but uh, the standard fire control group in the initial design was standard mill spec. They kept the familiar charging handle you have with the M16 as well. Now the upper and lower break apart the same way as the M16 do as well, for as far as maintenance is concerned. Uh, it hinges and you're able to remove the bolt, which we'll be taking a look at that in a few minutes. Now, unlike the Legacy system, uh, this is not a uh, internal piston, or some people want to say direct impingement, which is the wrong term, but uh, internal piston. This is a short stroke piston. So the bolt carrier group on here, as we see here, has some similarities to the AR-18. Uh, you have dual recoil springs. The stock on here, unlike the uh, M16 AR-15, does not contain the recoil mechanism, so we have a side folding telescopic stock. You can remove the stock. Uh, that was one of the major benefits that they put in. The bolt is very similar to that, but it is not compatible with that of the M16. In fact, none of the components that you see uh, in this bolt carrier group are compatible with that of the AR-15 M16 rifle. Another design feature of this rifle was a removable barrel. Basically, we have we remove this the, the handguard, we have two bolts, we unscrew those bolts, and we can pop out the barrel, which again, we have different calibers and we have different barrel lengths. Now, according to Chris Royce, there's 40% commonality of parts with this and the M4 carbine. So this was introduced... Uh, around 2012, and it has some additional uh, early teething problems. And those problems pretty much stemmed around the bolt carrier group. Uh, first issue they had was the recoil springs would come out of the back portion that you would see here, and it would cause uh, the operating rods and the springs to get bent up. Um, that was one issue, which was, uh, there was a cure for that as well. The other one was, now this was an issue that uh, was very, very limited. Stig had found on one particular type of ammunition that uh, there was a slam fire issue uh, with uh, the, the MCX carbine. So due to a safety issue, uh, whether it was perceived or not, uh, again, it was only one type of ammunition. Sig did want to redirect it. They did want to uh, take a look at it and see uh, if there was a way they could prevent it from happening. And they did a bolt upgrade where they actually added a firing pin safety on the top of the bolt carrier. Very similar to that of what, what HK did with the HK416 for the same reason. Uh, however, the, this was not a common issue. So what SIG did do is they offered a um, upgrade. It wasn't a recall. Uh, there was an upgrade. You could send in your, your bolt carrier group and they would send you out the, the newer upgraded one. And this bolt carrier here is one of the newer ones. Um, both of these ones here, actually the ones in this rifle as well as this one, these are out of the upgraded ones. These are very similar to that which you're going to see in the Spear Light, uh, but there were some additional modifications. Now those, those improvements were they added a firing pin block, a captive firing pin retainer, um, they made some modifications to the bolt lugs. They made them more uh, more recessed, uh, and they made some angles on here, so um, it was it was more durable. 
And the, the plate in the back here, originally this was a polymer plate that could be removed. Uh, then it's now made of steel and it's pinned in place so it cannot be removed. And it's also now removable where before um, you literally had to take a, a pin, a firing pin, it would stick it in the bottom here and that would remove the operating rod assembly off the top, which is another change that would go through uh, from the, you know, the original MCX to the Virtus to the Spear. Initially, you did have a design where you had a, a different piston assembly here uh, for the 300 Blackout versus the 556. Then they made some modifications to the barrels. Depending on a 300 Blackout versus the 556 barrel, your actual location of your gas block could be in different locations. For instance, you would have on the 300 Blackout, you would have the gas block was much closer than that of the 556 due to the use of subsonic ammunition. So that was dealt with by a longer piston rod or a, a modified version of the of, of the piston. And eventually that would be changed over to uh, a modification to the handguard where you would have two different slots in the handguard, one for the 300 blackout and one for the 556. You would have two different locations so you could have your access to your adjustable gas block. So taking a quick look at the MCX, which we do have a complete video on the MCX, but looking at some of the features we have here. Now the stock that came with it was not what you see here. The original stock was a solid stock that was just closed, that would just uh, that would just side fold. I didn't particularly care for this. Uh, I put on this, this is a fully adjustable side folding. Now when you wanted to adjust the stock, you literally had to pull upward and push over. That was a little bit of a pain in the way that that was done. Uh, that would be something that we later corrected on the SIG Spear. So we had a couple different versions of the pistol grips. Uh, the initial one was relatively uncomfortable. Then uh, we have this version right here. Now looking at the lower receiver, we have an ambidextrous safety. And the safety that SIG came up with on this was actually quite nice. It was rather large so when you have uh, gloved hands it was easy to manipulate. An oversized magazine release. When you flip it over, you would see we would have a uh, extended bottom of the bolt catch, which made it much easier for you to be able to uh, to lock the bolt open to the rear. And we had a ambidextrous magazine release as well. The charging handle was ambidextrous. Now looking over to the side here, you see we do have a forward assist. Now this is a module uh, between the forward assist and the, and the fire cartridge case deflector. Initially, this was developed. It was developed to be it was aluminum. So later in the Virtus uh, and the Spear Light, be turned over to a polymer. Now we have iron sights on here as well, or basically uh, basically Troy type uh, tri type sights. Now the handguard that we have on here, this is not the handguard that came with it. The handguard that you see here is the one that came with it. This was a uh, key mod. Uh, this one here uh, is a Midwest Industries M-Lock, and we had multiple M-Lock slots on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the bottom here. So we're going to go over disassembly. Okay, clear. Just like AR-15 M16, we have takedown pins. So we have a lower receiver. Now, this upper receiver can be placed on any standard AR-15 M16 lower receiver. So this could be something we can be bought as an upgrade. And there's also, uh, you can replace the receiver extension with a KNS adapter. Uh, so you can have a 1913 rail on the back here. Because again, this is a 1913 rail on the back here. So you can place any of these. Again, you have an MP5 style telescopic. You would have this, you know, this one here. And of course you have the one that you have on this on the spear can go on there. Trigger. Trigger was a very interesting uh, uh, part of this as well. Now initially you could use any kind of trigger that you wanted. Well once there was a modification that was made to the firing pin safety where you had to have the firing pin safety on here, the way that was shaped on the top of the hammer made a big difference. So the stick provided a specific hammer and a mill spec trigger are the only ones that would work with this boat carrier. Now, the trigger you see in here is Geisley. Geisley did make what they had as a, a, as a MCX uh, two-stage trigger. So you had this available, and then Stig would eventually go ahead and develop their own two-stage trigger. Uh, but you had to be very careful uh, what triggers you put in here, because if you had the wrong one, it would not actuate the firing pin safety, meaning it would not work. 775 T6 aircraft grade, grade aluminum. 
So now we take a look at the upper receiver. Pull back our charging handle again. This is a, this is a this is not a, a mil spec charging handle. This is specifically to this to this design. Boat carrier group and charging handle. Now to remove the handguard, you would just pull the handguard forward on this initial model. And the barrel that we have on here is the 556. So the top is the 556, bottom is uh, 300 blackout. Now uh, you do have the adjustable gas valves for suppressed and unsuppressed. On a 300 blackout, the settings are so they would work either suppressed or unsuppressed, unsuppressed with subsonic or supersonic ammunition. Uh, the 556 is just suppressed and unsuppressed. These are your two bolts that you have. It says one and two on here, so it tells you which ones that you would, uh, which you would have on there to adjust first. Now, for removal of the barrel, requires a specific tool. Now, this tool uh, was was designed for this gun by uh, by Borka Tools. It's, it's the specific 60 inch pounds. So basically, we would just unscrew the bolts. Now, this is the exact same way that all of these barrels would be removed for all three generations, the Virtus, the standard MCX, and the, the light. And there you have the barrel. Again, you could get these in, uh, this is a 16, 14 and a half, 10.5, uh, and, and whatever, of course, your different calibers as well. Um, you can remove the piston. Uh, it's not necessary, but that's all there is to it. And again, this is the same for all different variations, so we're not going to be taking apart the the, you know, the other version here. Unfortunately, we don't have access to a Virtus for this. We'll be going over the changes from the Virtus to the Spear Light. So we just torque these right back down. Now, unfortunately, I've had people ask uh, in the other video if this tool is still available. From what I understand, uh, Bork and Longer makes these. Uh, they made these for the Scar as well as the uh, as well as the Sig. It's sort of a shame that they stopped making it because this was a good tool to have uh, in, in your case. So you would go to number one first, and number two. Now, we also go to handguards. Handguards between the three models are not interchangeable. Uh, for, for the first generation to the second generation, and then of course the, uh, the Duver generation is totally different. This would slide right into the notch here, and you'd have your tab would go right into your front pivot pin hole right there, and that's what will lock that into place. That will go right onto the, to the receiver. Charging handle, bolt carrier group. So now come 2018. Come 2018 is the SIG Virtus, which is the next upgraded to this. There were some changes that were made. The biggest changes were in the bolt carrier group. Now the bolt carrier group, uh, the modifications that you saw uh, with the with the voluntary upgrade was there so you had the new front you would have the new uh bulk carrier group the most important uh aspect of that was the firing pin safety so we'll take a i want to uh, take a close look at the firing pin safety now this particular one here you're able to disassemble like you did the original one this was this had all the modifications with the exception of the pinned uh base plate on here so basically what we would do is we would pull downward on the springs that would pop right off now we could remove the two recoil springs the two operating rods would move forward. And now right here, what we see here is the firing pin safety. What that does is that has a physical lock on that firing pin. So what's going to happen is 
when the hammer comes forward, it's going to strike the top of that, push that upward, and when that moves upward, that's going to allow the firing pin to move forward. And then there's a there's a spring on the firing pin, which we're going to see when we take this apart. That once the uh, hammer hits, the bolt unlocks, the firing pin will spring rearward. It'll engage the firing pin safety. And the only way the firing pin can move forward is when the hammer is forward lifting it up. So we have a captive firing pin block. So we have a captive firing pin, retaining pin, which is an excellent, excellent feature. So now we have to uh, lift upward on the firing pin block to remove the firing pin. And here we have the firing pin with the firing pin spring. We lift upward on the charging hand, uh, lift upward on the, uh, the operating rod, lift upward on the cam pin, and we pull the bolt out. Now, as we can see, this is not a, an AR-15 M16 bolt. This is its own animal. And one of the changes that were made were radiuses that were cut on here instead of having it squared off like that of the uh, AR-15 M16. This is basically stress relief to make that bolt, uh, that bolt stronger. So again, the firing pin safety. This is the this is the sort of the neat, the more interesting part of this. This would continue over to the uh, spear, but uh, they would make some modifications to it. So for reassembly of the firing pin, we got to lift upward on the firing pin safety. Drop the firing pin in, push it all the way forward until that clicks. Push our firing pin retaining pin right back in place. Take our spring guides, drop them in from the front. Recoil springs. So what we do now is we got to pull downward on the on the springs. And there you have it. Okay. So we're going to see some photographs of the uh, the Virtus. And one of those major changes on the Virtus was the adoption of this stock that came on it. Again, this was much better. Uh, in fact, I think it's much better than the than the one that's on the current version. Telescopic as well as side folding. The original MCX came with uh, backup sights. The new SIG Virtus was optics ready. Basically, optics ready just meant that there was no backup sights that came with it. And it also came with a, a two-stage two trigger, which obviously was designed to work with the firing pin safety, where the initial rifle came specifically with a uh, single stage, like a standard M16 type trigger. And I probably would say the most significant improvement uh, was the firing pin safety, if you want to call that an improvement. Now, I, I definitely want to make sure that I iterate that I don't know if that was a necessary recall due to the fact that it was one specific type of ammunition that was used, but uh, that's what it was. So now we're going to go forward to 2022, the latest generation of the Spear Light. Now, this comes in connection with the M7 program. Of course, it was originally the XM5 program. Uh, now it's uh, M7. But basically what it was, the next generation rifle that uh, was chambered in 6 by six millimeter by 51. Uh, again, I'm not really going to get into the concept of the rifle here because, uh, you know, I have very strong feelings on uh, the fact I felt that the going with that larger caliber was a step rearward. But now uh, talking to Chris Royce uh, at the time where the MCX was being developed, that there was a 7.62 version of that rifle that was in prototype. Uh, however, it was not manufactured at the time um, that would sort of wait. So it was sort of in the background chambered in 7.62 by 51. And of course, with the the, the new uh, service rifle that they wanted chambered in six millimeter that would come back uh, chambered in the newer caliber. But uh, this basically, it was a rifle that was very similar uh, in many ways. However, it was chambered in different calibers, obviously, than, uh, because it was based off of the 5.56. 5.56, 300 blackout, and also 7.62 by 39. And part of uh, this, as well as the MC MCX, uh, was the magazine. Uh, Chris Rice went to work with Duramag, a C Products Defense down in Florida, to perfect a 762 by 39 magazine so the rifle would work uh, in this platform uh, with a 762 by 39 cartridge. 
But again, it was developed along with that. Now, I want to get you a little bit of my opinion right here. First of all, is what I thought our next generation rifle should have been. In my opinion, it should have been this chambered in 6.8 SPC. Uh, it would have been a much more practical uh, and a much more uh, realistic version of a rifle where you would still be able to maintain your assault rifle or an intermediate caliber uh, controllable fully automatic. You're still maintaining 30 round capacity. You're still maintaining that lightweight uh, and an easy rifle to manipulate. And you're not going backwards, uh, which we did with the with the M7, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But we're looking at some of the changes that we're, we're going to see on here. Uh, we're starting starting with the stock. The stock, they went back to a fixed type stock, but they made a couple changes. One was the cheek riser, and most importantly was they got rid of having to lift that upward, and they have a button on here now, so the button is much easier. Instead of having to lift upward um, on the rear of the stock, which is a much significant improvement. So next getting into the receiver. Now, unfortunately we don't have a vertice to compare this to, but when you compare this to the original, a significant amount of material has been removed from the receivers to lighten the, the weight up. And looking at some of the more important uh, improvements. Now, first off was weight reduction, as we said. Next, we're gonna look at these two QD slots in, in the rear. The original ones, you had the aluminum receivers. However, you have uh, when you put in your QD, you have steel ball bearings. Well, steel ball bearings on aluminum, you have you have a harder material and a softer material. SIG has now put in uh, insert steel inserts, so you don't have the wear, uh, so you don't have the issue with the uh, lower receiver wearing out. So we also have now have a polymer forward assist assembly and a shell deflector, which is modular. And probably one of my favorite features they added was the ambidextrous bolt release and bolt catch. So to engage, you push upward, pull back, and then to release, you push downward. So this is one of the most important features, I think, that was added uh, for modularity, making this thing fully ambidextrous where the Virtus and the original MCX uh, did not have that. We also have a difference in the location of the bolt release uh, and, the, and the magazine release. You notice we just have this L shape on here, where here it goes all the way across. It's much easier to engage the magazine release by accident on the original design versus the way that it is now. The bolt release is sitting up significantly higher. So we see a modification that's been done to here and the receivers had to be changed to accept this. So the next major change we're gonna take a look at is in the bolt carrier itself. Now, some of these changes uh, have made this rifle a little bit more difficult to work with and uh, this is one of them. Um, we're going to get into that right now. On top, we have the the, the Sig Virtus and the modified version of the uh, original MCX uh, bolt carrier group. In the bottom, we have the new Sig Spear. The first version, you were able to remove the uh, recoil spring assembly and piston assembly by basically just sticking your firing pin in here, pushing on a detent, and it would slide right off. The second version, uh, the one that was on the Virtus, you were not able to remove that. Well, on the Sig Spear, you were actually able to remove the entire top and the recoil spring assembly and the piston as an assembly, where you were not able to do that before. So another major difference between the uh, the first generation, second generation, and the third generation. The first generation, you had a polymer uh, end plate on here. Were you able to remove uh, the the end cap and remove the recoil spring assembly? The upgrade to the MCX and then the Virtus, you had a steel version where it was pinned in place so you could not remove the recoil spring assemblies. And that's carried over onto the uh, to the SIG Spear. But again, we have the ability to completely remove the uh, this piston recoil spring assembly on the, the new Spear. So now we get into this assembly. Everything's pretty much been changed up on this quite a bit. Uh, first off, you have the, uh, the the firing pin safety. As you, see, as you see, the firing pin safety on the top here has been relocated to a leaf spring on the side, which is located on the bottom, as you can see right here. Now this is very difficult to remove in the field because it, remo it requires uh, tools. And you're gonna see, I'm probably gonna have a hard time getting this thing out. So we're gonna show how simple, basically it was to disassemble the, uh, the, the original version. We had a captive, a captive firing pin retaining pin. We would just push inward. We just lift upward on the on the firing pin safety, firing pin would come right out, 
And now lift, just lifting upward on the, uh, the dog leg, we could remove the cam pin, remove the cam pin, and we could pull the bolt right out. So now we have a completely disassembled Virtus and original. Now it gets a little more complicated with the newer version. The firing pin, retaining pin, has been relocated to the top versus the bottom. So now we push on the detent from the bottom, we lift upward. Now we need to have some kind of a tool because, as you can see, we have the firing pin. Uh, the firing pin. Uh, the firing pin safety is now pushed inward onto the side of the the firing pin, so it locks into the collar. When the hammer comes forward, it pushes inward on the firing pin safety, pushing it out of the way so the firing pin uh, can protrude. So that basically has to be pulled to the side and removed. Again, this is extremely complicated to do this, to get that out of the way. Again, we have to make sure we keep the firing pin retaining pin out. Push inward and push outward to get that out. So, as you can see, we have a new uh, braided firing pin spring on here as well, so it's a stronger firing pin spring. And now we can lift out the cam pin and pull the bolt out. And again, the bolts are pretty much identical. Uh, they both have the modifications to the, to the bolt lugs. So basically, uh, there's just a few steps that were taken further. Now, for as far as the firing pin safety change on here was concerned, again, we can see that right here on the side. I can only guess why that was done, uh, because this decreased parts. Uh, now this bolt, uh, we saw a video that Mac put out, he did put the the new spear bolt carrier group in a Virtus and it did function properly, which again, that's because of the way this firing pin safety works. Now I do believe, and I can't say for sure, that this would eliminate a lot of the need to uh, have specific firing control groups uh, because you don't have to have anything to lift it out of the way. So I do believe this would allow you to use some more of the other uh, trigger groups. But again, without trying it, I can't I can't really see or can't really say for sure. Now for reassembly, bolt goes back in. Again, we make sure our extractor is at 3 o'clock. Drop our cam pin in. And again, this gets a little bit more complicated in, in reassembly because you got to push that out of the way. Drop our firing pin in, push over on the safety, that pushes it back into place. Take a little bit of pressure off of the firing pin, drive that back in, retaining pin back in, and now drop that and there you have it. Now we're going to take a look at the lower receiver. Now looking at the lower receiver, you see SIG's two-stage trigger. Now we also see a Aki wedge in here. Now on the original versions, you had a spring-loaded plunger uh, versus this, and that's sort of gone back and forth between the SIG 516 series and the uh, the MCX. Uh, you, they're pretty much standardizing on all these, these wedges right now. Now this is an anodized, this is not a Cerakote. Um, where a lot of the rifles that are flat and dark earth are serial coated, this is actually a, a uh, anodizing that's used uh, on the on the M7 as well. So now looking at the upper receiver. Now, unlike the original versions where you were able to just pop the handguard out, that's not the case we have with this one. With this one here, uh, we have to we have to remove uh, two screws on the side in order for this to come out. Now the now the suppressor that we have on here is the Sig uh, 762 suppressor. This is one that has been adopted by uh, the, M the M7 program. It is a SIG suppressor. This is an adapter, which is a flash hider as well as a mounting adapter for the SIG sound suppressor. Again, the barrel is a standard 16-inch uh, on, this, on this rifle. Uh, one and seven inch twist, 5.56 NATO. So when we look forward here, we have a adjustable gas valve. Now the interesting thing about this gas valve is it's set up for a 5.56 NATO. So when you have you have one position which is suppressed and unsuppressed, and the other setting is adverse conditions. So that's one of the interesting things about this versus uh, the other ones. Well, the other ones you would have uh, suppressed and unsuppressed. This is not. This is uh, one suppressed, unsuppressed, and one adverse. Adverse mostly meaning more gas, meaning if you decide you're going to put crap ammunition that didn't uh, conform to NATO specs that was lower powered, you'd have to allow more gas in. 
and that's uh, easily movable by a by a bullet tip. You just stick the bullet tip in there or any other tool. You have your markings on here for plus and negative. Now I got a lot of material has been removed on this uh, to make this lighter than the original rifle. So reassembly. Again, the charging handle has not been changed. It's the same on this one versus uh, the original versions. And for reassembly, we just drop the uh, bolt carrier group right back in. Drop the frame. So for installation of the sound suppressor, it just screws right into place and then you have a lock position. So what we're going to do now is we're take this to the range and we're going to see how it shoots. Now we're converted over to 5.56. Now we're going to change out the barrel on the MCX Vertus Bird, to 300 blackout. So making sure it's empty. We're going to separate the upper and the lower. And slide the handguard off. Now this is a particular uh, Borka wrench that's made specifically for this with the proper torque setting. We're going to take the 300 blackout barrel. Insert that all the way. Over. Now convert it into 300 blackout.
Well, all in all, we probably fired about 500 rounds through this rifle uh, with different kinds of ammunition. Ammunition, anything from uh, standard Lake City uh, M193, M855, Mark 262, Black Hills. Uh, we had some SIG 77 grain OTM as well as 55 grain full metal jacket. Uh, we fired both suppressed and unsuppressed and had no malfunctions of any sort. So the scope that we have on here, this came from the factory like this. This is the U.S. government issue, one that was uh, designed for the uh, M110A1 program. Uh, this is the, uh, the Tango 6. Uh, this is the flat dark earth version on a SIG mount. Uh, oddly enough, with the way this came from the factory, it was precisely zeroed. I didn't have to do anything with zeroing uh, this rifle at all. Now again, the sound suppressor uh, was their 7.62. Uh, this is convertible for 5.56 and 7.62. Uh, it's a manufactured of Inconel, a diameter of 1.67 inches, length of 7.4 inches, weight of 19.4 inches. It does have a monolithic core on it. Uh, the suppressor did have a reduction in, in back pressure. You can see a thermal issue is going to show you less discharge from the rear, uh, where it's going to have more of that pressure going out the front, so uh, you're going to get less gas in your face. Now, shooting for accuracy, well, this is where it got interesting. I had one group that was absolutely phenomenal uh, at 0 0.71 inches with Black Hills Mark 262. Uh, most of them were just around an inch, uh, inch and inch and a quarter. But I did have one group, it, whether, it was a, whether it was a fluke or whatever, uh, 0 0.71 inches with it. So that was very, very impressive. Now, overall impressions. Now, the, this rifle that you see here, this original one, is my personal rifle. Um, when the Sig Virtus came out, I looked at the two to see if I wanted to do an upgrade. Uh, since I made the change to the bulk here where I had all the major upgrades uh, for reliability, I didn't really see any kind of a need to uh, switch from the original MCX to the Virtus after changing out the, the bulk carrier group. Well, now comes this one. With the changes that have been put onto this one, uh, with the Ambi Safety, I like this rifle. Uh, this rifle will find its way into my collection one way or another. Uh, for as far as the optics concerned, the optic I think is a little bit too much for this rifle. You could use something a little bit lower powered. Uh, this is probably something to be better for a 7.62, uh, but this is the way this uh, came from SIG was set up with this particular optic on it. Um, for as far as the weight's concerned, uh, this is definitely a, a lighter weight rifle. Uh, the original one here, uh, you know, for as far as the feel, uh, it's it's very much the same rifle. Uh, you saw some of the benefits that came out of the XM7 program. Again, originally it was XM5, now it's XM7. Uh, again, the interesting thing was uh, supposedly SIG did not want any confusion with the Colt M5, which I find very interesting because Colt's M5 had nothing to do with the U.S. government. Uh, the M5 on there was for commercial use only. It wasn't like, uh, you know, the M4, for instance, where... Colt originally had had the uh, trademark on the uh, M on M4 and found out later that uh, the the trademark on M4 was completely invalid because you could not trademark a U.S. government nomenclature. Uh, M4 was U.S. government, so they couldn't do that. So the reason why SIG uh, changed saying it was because of the Colt M5, it, it just is sort of mind-boggling to me since you know the M5 has nothing to do with any kind of U.S. government uh, you, know, you know name. But whatever. So now it's the M7. But this rifle here, I believe, had much more potential for the next service rifle uh, in chambered in 6.8 SPC than what we have right now. Because this rifle here, selective fire in 6.8 SPC, you would not be losing any kind of close quarter battle or, or any kind of ability to, uh, to uh, perform in meeting engagements or ambushes. Uh, you're not going to have uh, the, the heavier recoil, the decrease in magazine capacity. Um, the increase in noise of having a 13 inch barrel and you're also not going to have an 80,000 PSI uh, you know, barrel chamber pressure. Um, I believe overall this would have been a, a excellent option for the next service rifle uh, chambered in that 6.8 SPC. Um, I'm very fond of it. I do believe this is a beautiful rifle. I like what they did with uh, changing some of the, uh, the the feel to it, making this handguard a lot narrower from the original one. The original one was like a, was like a humongous uh, 2 by 4 uh, it was very blocky. This is a better feel to it. Again, going with M-Lock, where the uh, original one was key mod. Uh, then the Virtus went to M-Lock. Now, this is M-Lock. The parts on here, again, are not necessarily interchangeable with the other two. The handguard, for instance, is not interchangeable with the other two. Uh, so you do have some proprietary parts on it. But uh, overall, I think they did a hell of a job on this. I think this has potential for uh, any kind of military service anywhere in the world. 
uh, you know, it's also a credit to the gentlemen who were involved in the development, uh, Chris Royce and Robert Hurt, uh, two of the probably the most brilliant uh, engineers we've had uh, in the last 20 years in the industry. Uh, their work does continue. Um, now you also have commercial versions of this rifle in 7.62 NATO as well as the 6x51. Now the 6x51 ammunition is still very, very, very rare. Um, we're still waiting to see uh, what the MSRP is going to be on the 308 version of the of the spear. Uh, so we're waiting to see that. I do hope to get my hands on one of the uh, the spears at some point in the not too distant future to do a review on. So I do hope you guys enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, even better share. Thank you.